Hi, everybody, and welcome to Live from the Lab. During this series, we explore different technologies that Brooker has uh, created and developed in order to help researchers to understand the world around us. I'm John Genke, and today I'm joined by my colleague, Dave Sampson. Hi, John. So today's topic is resolution in XRM, X-ray microscopy. So Dave, I am familiar with resolution in terms of light microscopes. But here we're kind of working with X-rays and virtual things. How does that compare to light microscopy? Well, there's some comparisons and some, some differences. In light microscopy, your fundamental resolution is the photon. So 400, 500 uh, nanometers would mm -hmm. be your ultimate resolution for a microscope. You get a factor in the lenses. That's kind of blue light. Blue factor. light would be 400, okay. micron, 400 yeah. nanometers. Um, in um, X-ray microscopy, you know, the wavelength of an X-ray is down in the angstrom. We don't have X-ray, we don't have angstrom resolution. It'd be nice, but we yeah. don't. And so angstrom, now how big is an angstrom? That might be a, f a unit that's not familiar to everybody. Uh, 10 angstroms to a, a nanometer. Okay, so kind of atomic. Yeah, scale. atomic level. Uh -huh. Atomic step is about two angstroms. Okay, so great. So uh, in XRM, we can achieve this no. atomic? Okay. No, we can't. Um, there's a lot of things that go on, um, and we're going to go through there. Like the first one is voxel resolution. When we talk about voxel resolution, we're talking about what are the fundamental parameters that generate resolution on the collection side. How, what's the ultimate resolution my detector and my electronics yeah. can generate? So it's kind of an ideal An ideal case. situation. And so you, you're saying that that has a few components to it? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and the main part would be the detector. Okay. Um, so you have a, a CCD or a flat panel detector that can have a thousand to mm -hmm. uh, ten thousand pixels across, so you know tens of megapixels. Okay, um, kind of like the sensor in a camera. Exactly. Okay. It's, it's, it's very similar technology. Yeah. yeah. Um, so with that, we can define we can get pixel resolution defined that way, and based on um, X-ray microscopy, we have geometric magnification, which means that. The magnification is a function of the position of the sample with respect to the source and the detector. So yeah, I kind of remember that from our last episode for XRM, which we showed that animation. And you had the source distance. Right. You had the detector distance. Right. And when you crunch all those calculations, you can theoretically get voxel resolution. So remember, a voxel is a 3D pixel. Yes. Um, you can get voxel resolutions down into hundreds of nanometers. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, I would even imagine if I take the sample and I put it infinitely close, well, we have the distance divided by infinitely right. close is right. infinite exactly. resolution, right? So that would be your voxel resolution. Okay. So um, you can always get from, you can just continually build on your detector, higher yeah. level detectors, smaller pixels on your detector, because F actual is factors in as well. You can get really high voxel resolution, very okay. small voxel. So this idealized resolution without real world factors. Correct. Okay. So that is voxel resolution. Okay. So now I think the next point that we're going to talk about is... Spatial, spatial. resolution. Now, spatial okay. resolution deals more towards the fundamental instrumental parameters. Okay. How is my instrument designed? What factors go into the, um, the equipment that leads to a different form of resolution? And that's an instrumental resolution. So I imagine one of these is what we were just talking about, getting the samples close to the, right. to the source. And so there's a fundamental prop principle. You can't get... Your, your sample infinitely close. Yeah. You can't get infinite magnification. Yeah. But also, an X-ray source is a real source. In other words, it has a diameter. Okay, okay. Like a flashlight, we would have a certain size to the right. emission. Right, you can't mm -hmm. make a infinitely small light source. Yeah. You can't yeah. make an infinitely small X-ray source. Yeah. I mean, you can spend high money and go to a beam line. <laughs> sure, yeah, at the beam line, they can make those <laughs> really tiny. But yeah. you're not gonna do that on the bench top in your lab. Okay. So typically, from a lab type XRM unit, you're gonna go from say five microns down to 500 nanometers. Okay, so we do reach that nanometer. We do reach scale. that nanometer. Okay, um, great. You know, and so each system, depending on how it's designed and how what kind of power is used, you can get mm -hmm. you know, sources, uh, yeah. um, spatial resolution in that, in that. So we have how close you can get the sample, that's giving us a limit, the size of the source focus, that's giving us a limit, and then also there's some vibration, right? True. True. Um, so when you talk about noise, instrument noise, vibration mm -hmm. noise, you're, you add an error, uh, a layer of uncertainty to your resolution. Okay. So um, if you, yeah, if you try to put your system on a really noisy environment, your X-ray source is going to be bouncing around, your detectors are okay. going to be bouncing around, and that's going to add, or it's going to take away your resolution. So it's going to increase your um, 
ultimate resolution yeah. that you can get or make it worse. And I think the, the last component of this, you can go to the ultimate resolution, but as those buckets get smaller and smaller, we have a problem with catching counts, right? Exactly, exactly. And that's always the experimental design you'll have to deal with. Um, if you go to a, de a larger detector with larger pixels, your fundamental resolution isn't going to be as small, but you're going to be able to um, collect a lot more photons at a faster speed, which means your experimental lengths are going to be shorter. If you want to go to ultimate resolution where you use really small detectors, really small pixels, a CCD detector, then your photon counting is going to go way down, and it may take you an exorbitant uh, time to collect all your data. Yeah, I mean, one way I sometimes like to think about counting statistics, imagine that it was raining outside. So you have a constant amount of rain that's coming down per unit area. If I put out a bunch of five-gallon pails, well, they're gonna, each pail is going to get quite a bit of water in it. On the other hand, if we reduce that down to little solo cups, well, each one gets a lot less, and now we're going to have some variance in each individual cup. Yeah, it's a and, great way of looking at it, yeah. Yeah, so we get a little bit more noise, and that becomes our limiting factor, right? Right, right. And okay. like, like you said, the smaller the pixel, the smaller your counting statistics, the greater your noise. Okay. So there is a, a, a noise versus um, counting trade-off yeah. as well. So then I guess when we're thinking about these measurements, we kind of have to take all three of these things into, into account. Correct, right? and design your experiment for what you need. Okay, so in terms of then balancing voxel and spatial resolution, there is some benefit, though, to using a pixel size that's slightly smaller than the feature we're looking at, right? Exactly, exactly. If you have one pixel, if you set your, your voxel size to your spatial resolution, um, I mean, that's acceptable, mm -hmm. but it does limit you in what you can see. It's actually a benefit to have, say, five or ten voxels per your spatial resolution to get ultimate resolution. Because you can see differences between two voxels or two, you know, say you've got a five micron resolution and you've got a five micron um, object that you're trying to see. Well, you can't really see that, but if you have 10 pixels per that five microns, you will begin to see some evidence of that five micron. So I guess one last question is, how do we show resolution? Do we have a standard? Do we have you know, do we put some sort of a projection sample in there or? Well, yeah, um, there's several ways of doing resolution. Okay. Um, and there's a couple of resolution standards that we use. Um, most of us, we use what's called a GEMA standard. Okay. Which is an, an X and a Y grid. Mm -hmm. that yeah, we I'm familiar with that from microscopy. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And that's how we measure. We actually take our measurements, uh, we take the data, and then we extract, we calculate yep. out what our ultimate resolution is from those standards that we... So that's a series yeah. of bars it's a on a flat of, plate. Yeah, it's a series of okay. bars, and depending on the standard, it goes from tens of microns down to nanometers. Are and, there any standards, though, because uh, we're getting into kind of 3D here, right? Yes. And so is there any standards that, that work in 3D? Um, yes, that's still up for debate. I mean, there's mm -hmm. still, the industry is still working on the best way to go about three-dimensional standards at this point. Okay. So, and I noticed one other little kind of nuance that you had said there. We kind of, at some point, switched from pixels to voxels. And I'm familiar with pixels, you know, right, like a right. camera. What's a voxel? Like I said, a voxel is just a three-dimensional pixel. So if you have a, a TIFF image, a, yep. a, a bitmap image, um, it has an X and a Y, and then a grayscale value. Okay. And yep. it represents yep. a, a two-dimensional surface. Yep. In a, a voxel, it's an X, Y, and a Z. So it represents a three-dimensional surface. So it's X, Y, Z, and grayscale. Ah, and for okay. what we do, um, even though it doesn't have to be, we use isotropics, which means X, Y, and Z are all the same length scale. Okay. So it's a volumetric pixel. Correct. Ah. All right. So I think at this point, what we're going to do is head on over to the lab and see some of this in action. So here we are. We are in the XRM lab. Um, last time we talked about that first machine that we were just seeing, and now we're talking about this uh, Skyscan 2214, a little bit bigger unit. Yeah, and this is what we'd call a nano micro or CT. Okay. And uh, how does this one differ then from uh, the one that we had seen previously, the smaller units? And there's a couple of key fundamental differences. Mm -hmm. One of them is the X-ray source. Okay. Um, so on most de desktops, you have a closed X-ray source, um, easy, simple to use, very low maintenance. Um, this one has a um, an open source, 
So you actually have a filament that you can change in and out. Mm -hmm. um, it's much bigger and it um, generates a lot more power. And okay. We can get um, higher, brighter source, smaller beam. So this one will go down to um, less than 500 nanometer yeah. as a spot size, whereas three to five microns is typical for a bench top. So here's an example of uh, that filament that Dave was just talking about. So that's kind of a replaceable cartridge. And then after that piece, we have a series of lenses, right? Right. So on a bench, a standard bench shop, you'd be just straight through to the detector. And then on an open source like this, you'll have a series of lenses that then focus mm -hmm. and shape the electron beam. So if you want to have, if you want to obtain better resolution, you can make that spot smaller. Correct. Okay. And if you want more power, you can make the spot bigger. And that's a change that you have to do physically on the machine? No, it's purely electronic. It's, it's just, it just switches that we can set and it changes the parameters. Then you can tune it a little bit um, okay. and align it. And then the next element of resolution that we talked a little bit about was the actual sample positioning. Correct. Right? So here we have uh, the sample. It's kind of uh, two-thirds of the way back. So yep. it'll be kind of a lower yeah. resolution type scan. So it looks like a pencil, maybe? It is. Yeah. It's a pencil. Okay. So uh, a lot of kids getting back to school, school now. And, and um, So if we wanted to go to higher resolution, we'd bring that forward. Yeah. And we have um, our flat panel detector, which is our general purpose detector. And then we can also, if we wanted to go to a higher resolution, then we can even switch to a, a higher resolution CCD yeah. detector. And then in terms of that last component we talked about, which was vibrations. Yes. What do we, I mean, this certainly has a lot of weight to it, but yeah. is there anything so this, else? This has a, um, a, a, a nice rigid air table so that we actually, the whole system is floated on air so that, that the, damps out the vibrations of the room and maintains uh, yeah. a, a calmer environment. And so everything is actually floating on that table? The source? Everything, of, the entire yeah. source, the whole, it's one big giant unit. <laughs> if your source and your detector were not floated together, then they would oscillate in different uh, frequencies yeah. or different ways, and that would actually hurt your resolution. So now with the sample, during the measurement, it's actually going to spin, right? Correct. And there we can also sometimes have problems. I mean, I know bearings, they kind of have some wiggle to them. Again, this is an air bearing. Oh, so okay. again, so yeah. the rotation is on a, the, the rotational uh, stage is floated as well to minimize vibration and to make the rotation smooth. Okay. So um, I think if we get a little bit closer here, we can see the, uh, the change of that detector. So here we have a flat panel, right? That's so correct. That would be the one that you're using for most coverage? Yes. And then if we change over to... Three one of the others. Now, we just click a button in the software. So it kind of moves like a garage door. Exactly. Yep. It pivots up out of the way, and then the, um, the detector you choose will then rotate into position all pre-aligned. All right. So now, we go back maybe and we actually can see some data getting collected. We'll put that flat panel back down. So if maybe we can start with a projection of this in a lower resolution setup. Right. So here we're looking at um, the pencil. We have a uh, resolution of System default is 33.9. And let me just pull that up to say um, five microns. So I could kind of see the layer on the edge here. That's probably the paint, I'm guessing. Yes, you can and see then... the paint. You can see the lead itself. Yeah. Um, down at the bottom, you can see a little bit of the metal that contains yeah. the um, eraser. Now, is this actually, uh, this, this 2D image, is this uh, the full data set that we're getting right now? or Well, this would be a two-dimensional uh, radiogram. Okay, so, so a single a cinema. If I wanted to collect a full image and I would take hundreds or a thousand of these yeah. um, to create a, three, a full data set that then we can analyze and reconstruct a three-dimensional object. Okay, so now I can see that we're starting to get some of these uh, extra little bits here. And I'm guessing the resolution will be better in the 3D set. Yeah, a little bit. Uh -huh. and, and that's actually grain structure inside the pencil. That you're oh, seeing. really? Yeah. Okay. So now can we actually obtain any better resolution in the projection? Sure, sure. I mean, I could go up to. Um, let me put the CCD panel back in. Takes a minute, but it's not that long. No. I mean, click of a button, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So 
So when we talk about flat panel and CCD, is it a different technology that we just get smaller pixels? Correct. And so now we're down to um, basically one micron resolution. So now here where the dark would be the graphite core. Okay. And then you're seeing, um, you now this would be structure within the wood itself. Mm -hmm. But kind of like what we talked about before, when we get counting statistics, now we start to see some of that going on with a lot of right, the stipples. Right. And, and so the amount of time it takes to collect this x-ray mm -hmm. is about three times longer than it was to collect the fat panel. Now, I think you've taken some data at different resolution conditions that we yeah, just do absolutely. a quick look at. So and this here, software is all included with the absolutely. instrument, right? Okay. So here we have the pencil, mm -hmm. and I've processed the data, and we're looking at 50 micron resolution. Okay. We can see the, the graphite core. You know, there's something, a few dark and white spots. Um, you can see the paint on the outside. As I drop down now to 10 micron resolution, now oh, we're wow. seeing, yeah, so there we got the graphite core. I kind of have it processed so to uh, emphasize the wood structure. You can see pore structure. Um, let's drop down to five microns. So now we have, now we got a little bit more of the graphite structure showing up. We're definitely seeing the major pore structure and then some of the minor structure. We definitely have paint. And then um, one last one, let's go down to one micron. So here we are at one micron, we got Really good definition inside the graphite. We can see bright and dark, low, low and high uh, density areas, as well as a lot more detail of the small pore structure within the pencil itself. So it, it seems like it would be a real benefit to have access to the different length scale depending on the question that we're trying to ask. About exactly, that. exactly. If you wanted, yeah. If you're looking at how well is my paint coating on my pencil, that's one length scale. If I want to study the pore structure of the wood itself, then we, we need to go to the ultimate re higher resolution. Yeah, if we go back to maybe the last one, it's kind of interesting um, to see some of these little gaps, like almost a crack, huh? Yeah, that would be a crack yeah. in the paint. Yeah. And um, then up here, we actually see how the wood porosity has affected maybe the... Right, it's filled into a pore. Uh-huh. Um, and I could actually, um, if I wanted to, I could probably read the writing down the side of the pencil. Oh, wow. Um, I could even imagine this little, having this unlucky pore set here might cause some additional cracking. Exactly. In and the so lead. You're actually looking at a gap of the wood around the lead itself. Yeah. Or the graphite, I guess. Or the right? graphite. Again, <laughs> it's not lead, it's graphite. Yep. Yep. It's even kind of interesting how we can see the, uh, the, the structure of the wood itself here on this piece that's going this way, and then over there it's and going a different actually, direction. Actually, and then this line right here corresponds to the two halves of the pencil that were then glued together to form the full pencil. Yeah. So it's really then that question of what are you looking for, right? Like exactly, exactly. Yeah. Sometimes you don't always want to use the highest resolutions. So no, no, you, you, you want to use the resolution that gives you the, da the data you need the quickest. Yeah. All right, well, thanks for showing this to us. So we're going to head back uh, to the studio and then we'll answer some of your questions. All right, so here we are back in the lab. Uh, first thing I wanted to point out, if you like this series of videos that we've been shooting, uh, make sure to like, subscribe, and share them uh, with all of your friends. So during this segment now, if you have any questions and we don't happen to get to them during this segment, uh, make sure to email them to live.events at brooker.com. So the first question that we have that's come in uh, is from Bob, and it says, does the size and shape of the sample limit your resolution? Um, and the answer is yes. Um, because when we showed before the geometric magnification, um, I was able to get a pencil very close to the um, source, and I can get very high magnification. If that pencil were six inches around, that would limit how close I could get to the um, detector, and then that would limit the magnification that I can get. So now I noticed that in this example, you had actually kind of truncated the pencil a little bit. Is there any way we could actually measure a long Yeah, pencil? absolutely. That was just for ease of use. Um, if I have a long, thin sample like that, I've got a couple options. One of them is I can just take um, segments and stitch those segments together. So like, say, do three separate full measurements and add those together. Or I can do a spiral scan where I actually 
run the, the system through a corkscrew and I collect data through the entire set and then I reconstruct that entire data set. And I think what we're going to do is a future episode on that spiral scanning, but there's also a benefit in resolution, right, correct, for spiral correct, scanning. Correct. Um, there is, when you have a geometric um, magnification, there is um, a little bit of resolution differences between what happens at the center and what happens at the outside. Okay. And that can give you some artifacts on some samples. It's not critical, but you uh -huh. can definitely see some things. So when you go through a spiral scan, you actually get an equal resolution from top to bottom. Okay. Uh, and then I guess one last follow-up from that. I would imagine then when you're mounting a sample, to obtain the best resolution, it's best to try to put the thinnest dimension into the, the beam direction. So if you have something that's long, you should try to point that up and down. Correct, correct. Not necessarily towards right, the, right. the beam. Yeah, you, you're, you're, um, the major constriction is getting the x-rays through. So if you have a, you want to uh, minimize that, the, the x-rays the through the sample. So then the next question that we have, um, this one is from Sally. And it says, what is the wavelength of an X-ray photon, and does that wavelength affect our resolution? Um, really, um, it, it affects more of the power than it does the resolution. So um, we, we use um, a tungsten source. OK. You're the X-ray expert. Uh, uh, <laughs> I couldn't tell you what that wavelength is, because it really doesn't matter to yep. what I do. I'm really more concerned about the power that I'm getting out of the system. OK. So yeah, I mean, tungsten is at a, what's the? Excitation voltage, it's about 100 to 130 kilovolt. Yeah. So really, I mean, that corresponds to a wavelength that's way sub-angstrom. So much smaller than atomic resolution. And really, like you said, then it boils down to the penetration power. Correct. Right? Correct. So how, how much punch do you got? And then like all of our X-ray sources are tunable. Mm -hmm. So that if I am doing a metal object, um, I will be up in that 100, 130. Like aluminum, I'll go up to 100, 130 kilovolts. But if I am doing wood or I'm doing a polymer, then I will drop it way down to 20 to 25 kilovolts. Okay. And um, I guess I've heard before that if you have um, too high of a power, it can actually degrade resolution. Correct. Correct. If you have too high of a power, you don't get any contrast. Okay. Because your x-rays are blowing through without really interacting with the sample. So you need that contrast. You actually want um, to, you want about 60% of the x-rays to be absorbed or 40 to 60% of the x-rays to be absorbed going through. Okay. So then the next question um, that we have, um, and this is actually our last question for the day. Uh, does a detector with smaller pixels provide better resolution? There, yes, it does. Because um, the smaller the pixel, um, it, it basically goes down to we can get some smaller voxels. Mm -hmm. So yes, it, it does provide better resolution. Lack of a so in the end, answer. but once you add in, so if you're moving, let's say that you're moving from 60 nanometer pixel yeah. to 50. Yeah, you're not going to really make much of a difference. But really, it's when you transition from uh, pixel sizes of the order of the um, spatial resolution to below. You'll, okay. you'll see a benefit from that. So if you're moving from 5 micron pixels down to 1 micron, one micron you'll you're definitely see, see that mm -hmm. in your data. Um, but if you're moving from 20 to 15, you're really not going to see yeah. a whole lot. And, and if you move from, say, like uh, like I said, 60 to 50 nanometers, not really going to see really? that at all. Yeah. So um, thanks for joining us for our episode today. Uh, we'll have another episode next month. And um, if you liked everything again, um, make sure to like and subscribe. And uh, we'll see you next time. And until then, keep your signal high and your background slow. <laughs>